Well, you live and practice law for 40 years in the community. And if you've done that for 40 years, maybe you've been good to it, but it's been good to you. So it all, you become a part of that. Just like the practice of law is a part of me. Someone asked me if I wanted to retire. Would I retire? Uh, no, no. I like what I do. It becomes who you are. It becomes a part of your purpose. And if you lose your purpose, I don't know what you do in life. It's pretty well downhill from then on. And I don't want to do that. Mike, this is such a treat for me. You are uh, so highly respected in Middle Tennessee and throughout, really, further than that. Uh, but you live right here in McMinnville and Viola, the Viola community. You, you actually were born in D.C., moved back to this area, uh, grew up in Viola, I guess, to some extent, and, and were in the Marines and came back. And So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about some of the things you, you are really sort of what I would call a Renaissance man. You know, you're a successful attorney. You're a philanthropist. You've made such a difference in your community, but you're a poet and an artist. And How did that all come to be? Well, I think you state it uh, maybe more grandly <laughs> than others might. Uh, I, I've just been interested from the time I was a child in reading a lot. And I think from that you develop a broad perspective, whether you live in a, a smaller community or not. And I grew up in Viola one would have to say that that's a small community. Uh, I think a friend of my family were, were the Ramseys, and my best friend was a Ramsey, and his dad always said, uh, Viola is the hub of the universe. Everything goes around it. <laughs> so, so, so what we had was a little community library there, and my mother and dad, who were very much into education and, and, and writing and reading, and, and, and gave me the, ed, ed, the, the idea of education, mm -hmm. and the education, and the mentoring. For instance, I wanted to go away to school, or they wanted me to go away to school. Mm -hmm. Dad had me read instead, since I didn't want to, the Harvard classics throughout high school. Wow. And, I, and he was a pretty hard taskmaster on that. What did they do? What did your folks do? Actually, uh, they moved. Dad was in Washington, D.C. with the government. Mom was uh, also with the government as a legislative assistant for a senator from West Virginia. And uh, then World War II broke out mm -hmm. shortly after I was born and, uh, and my twin brother. And uh, Dad went to the military. And shortly after that, we moved uh, to Tennessee, where my grandfather was living at that time. And he was from Illinois my mother, where my dad grew up, and my mother was from West Virginia. Now, your, your grandfather, wasn't he pretty famous? Didn't, hadn't there been well, quite a bit know, about him? Well, you know, history came down on the same side he was. <laughs> in the 1920s, uh, he was a sheriff in southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, the name Galligan gives a hint, he was Irish. And in this town, at that time, of course, you came across, uh, you had the mining in Marion, Illinois. You had the mining interests, you had the farmer interest, and, and you had uh, the anti-alcohol interest, which really didn't fit well with the immigrants from Ireland and or Italy, who were all there due to the mining. So there was a lot of conflict in different cultures that were, uh, were there fussing with each other. And the Ku Klux Klan moved in on it, and my granddad was the sheriff, and the Ku Klux Klan wanted to take uh, the law into themselves to mm -hmm. enforce this liquor thing. I suspect my granddad, uh, it was a, a work of, 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 of his own interests, <laughs> because he probably liked a sip of whiskey. And, uh, but he fought against the Ku Klux Klan, wow. and it became a battle and a war, and it's, there's books written about it, and he wrote a book about it, and various others did at that time. Wow. So, he, and he ended up, of course, being correct, because there's no, ex, 
my opinion, no excuse for the Ku Klux Klan. No, no. Well, did, is that where you got your writing ability, do you think? Do you think you picked that up from your grandfather? Well, I was certainly interested that he did, and, and they, of course they had the early 19th, you know, 20th century uh, writing, which was just a little more flamboyant than we do these days. Right. But uh, I, I remember from uh, grade school and high school on being interested in writing. Now, how did you get into poetry? I, I noticed you have a book of Irish poets, and did you read poetry a lot? Did you? I, at some in, in high school, and certainly uh, in the Harvard Classics, there were, there were those uh, poets that I had to read. And, and, and found that I enjoyed it, really. And uh, then I wrote a poem in high school, which was not very good and fortunately not saved, uh, about losing a football game, of all things. But it added a little more meaning, perhaps, than a game. And, uh, and wrote on and off uh, most of my life since then. You know, I'm, I'm always fascinated with poetry, because I think you, you create such imagery in such a short space. And it's impactful, it's beautiful. I, I want you to share some of your poetry. I, I think that is the art of it, and that is to, to state something. In a, it, it's in a condensed fashion, but it's the use of metaphors and imagery and stuff that may bring it alive to somebody. Now you're working on a work called Viola Fields, is that right? Well, there, I, I am. Mm -hmm. I'm and it's, and certainly it's not in any complete state. But. Okay, but it's in a combination of your art uh, right. and, and also some of your poetry. Right. Would you share anything from that? Well, you'd asked me that earlier and uh, yeah. asked me to get this book out, and <laughs> I guess kind of reluctantly, but I will. Well, uh, you're, you're very gracious to do that, because I did ask you, but I, well, I hope I didn't twist your arm to do that. Well, of course you twisted my arm, <laughs> but, but uh, I think that's your job. Anyway, it is, it is. Uh, the poem's called Yellow Field. Certainly it's about Viola, Tennessee, where I grew up. Yellow Field. A yellow field in the Viola Spring is not aware of the drying death about it. Though it is there in the old fence row, in the woods and in the very green and yellow field from where the brightness springs. I stand as a Janus on the banks of murmuring, gurgling Hickory Creek, beneath the tree line of this field, looking upstream and down, as a silvery bass leaps to snap an emerging fly. This field, this water, has streamed through my life like blood. I remember when we were green and yellow, dancing through the fields of Viola, and I know we were unaware of the insistent marching drought in the cells of our mothers. Wow, I love that poem. And, and the painting that is very reflective of those yellow fields. Um, how did you come to write that? What were you thinking when you penned that? Well, I, I think I was, it's hard to describe exactly what you were thinking. I, I guess what happened was I saw this field we would played in as a child. Uh, Bill Ramsey and Bobby Ramsey and my brother and I, we'd played football out there in the fields. We'd searched for old coins and we would uh, uh, play uh, uh, any numerous games and stuff. And I know, and, I, and, and, and Ms. Ramsey was ill at this time and she later died. And, she, uh, and a lovely lady who's written several cookbooks herself and, and kept me full many times. And, um, and I, and, and, I, and I saw this field, and it just, it, what you do is it brings an image. It is an image, and then some, somehow a metaphor comes, and, you, and a line comes. And uh, then you just start writing. You know, I don't want to, I think when you intellectualize it, it's not the same. It takes thing. away. Well, it is very well, rich. And, and you're it, adding yeah. maybe something you didn't even think of. <laughs> well, I, I liked it very much, and I look forward to the, to the published work at some point when you get it, get it together. I know you're working on that. You've, you've actually made a huge difference in your community in so many ways. As a philanthropist, you've, you've created paintings and given them away to raise money for the library. Um, what motivates you in that? What, what's the motivation? Well, you live and practice law for 40 years in the community. 
And if you've done that for 40 years, maybe you've been good to it, but it's been good to you. So it all, you become a part of that. Just like the practice of law is a part of me. Someone asked me if I wanted to retire, would I retire? Uh, no, no, I like what I do. It becomes who you are. It becomes a part of your purpose. And if you lose your purpose, I don't know what you do in life. It's pretty well downhill from then on. And I don't want to do that. Uh, so to answer your question is if you are part of the community and the community is a part of you, it's kind of like you're all together mm -hmm. and all the parts are there. And you need to contribute with those parts. And I do what I can. And the library is a key piece to any community. Well, it is to me. My, my, the books were a big part of my life. So you, you kind of lead to, uh, you're led to wherever in your youth was influential to you. But I also try to do things for people who, are, who, who may need some help. What, what are your favorite subject matters to paint? What, when you're, and what kind of medium do you work in? I work in oils, mostly. I've done pastel, I've done watercolor, uh, maybe one or two acrylics. It's not my most fond uh, medium. Uh, so it's mostly oils, uh, uh, landscapes, waterscapes, uh, people. Mm -hmm. Some of my favorite things to have done were, uh, have been uh, uh, portraits of people. And I like doing that. I like the sense of looking at the line of a face, looking at the light hitting a face, and trying to get that right. I'm now trying, I'm looking, I'm working more in a kind of an abstract mm. manner, some. And I don't know, I, I'm a, I, I just, it keeps me out of trouble on the weekends and early mornings. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm, I don't have illusions that I'm a Picasso or anything. And I don't, I, I really don't care. I guess that'd be nice, but uh, not with some of the baggage he had. Uh, really? Well, your paintings are great. I, I love what I've seen, and um, and they're very inspirational too. I mean, they 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 speak a lot. Even the painting that you did about 9/11, um, that's very moving. It's literally moving, and and evokes an emotion. I like doing scenes where there's movement. Mm -hmm. Somehow it seems I can catch a movement. Uh, e maybe sometimes easier than a still figure. Let, let's talk about um, law for a little bit because you've had quite a successful career and that has to be a challenging career. Um, but you've, you've gone, you've tried cases all, almost to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, but you've been a winner, so uh, I guess you don't get there unless you are not, right? Well, it's very difficult to get to the United States Supreme Court because they don't take, but throughout the United States, uh, they don't get, they don't take that many cases a year. So you're, you just, maybe as the lawyer, you're fortunate if you get that. If you're the client, you're probably not all that fortunate <laughs> since the case means that's going to be about seven or eight years old. Right, right. So I, I haven't, but I, I like the practice of law. If there was a situation where circumstances and an employment met someone who was, who really loved doing that, it was here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, that's just what I ought to do. And I didn't start out wanting to be a lawyer. Well, what See, my dad had a law degree, oh, wow. but didn't really practice. And uh, he kind of wanted me to go to medical school and stuff. But then, as it turned out, I became interested in literature, and I was going to go to uh, do graduate studies in literature, and I thought of being an a, a, a English professor. Well, then came along and I joined the Marine Corps during Vietnam. And, uh, and, and while I was in Okinawa, before I went to Vietnam, I, I, was a, uh, I was a lieutenant then. I later became a captain in, in, a, in the infantry. But I was uh, appointed to hear a, a case as, uh, as, a, as an officer could be done at that time as kind of a judge of a lower level judge thing to hear a, a, a court martial type thing. Well, that interested me, and uh, more so, 
and I decided to go ahead and apply to law school. And when I was out of, got out of the Marine Corps, I immediately went to UT Law School. Wow. Did, did you, what part of the law did you like the most? What part of it? I always, I, I had also read mm -hmm. To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, which greatly influenced me, as it did many young folks at that time, I think, to be the, and, and also in Faulkner's books, mm -hmm. the lawyer was the non-judgmental advisor. Because at that time, less so now, but at that time, I think people sometimes were fearful of going to the ministers because of the, the, the attachment of judgment and sin. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so as a, as a lawyer, you could be the advisor and the counselor and, and, and help people. It seemed, uh, it, you know, it was my idealistic, I guess, youth and stuff. And so I wanted to go to law to go to a, a community and practice law. Open an office and start your practice of law. Were you a good orator? Were you good at arguing? You mean as a child? I hope I'm good now. My clients <laughs> sure do thank God of me. I, I bet you're good now. Uh, you just seem like you have a wonderful sense and a, and a wonderful presence. So I wondered if that was part of it. Did you enjoy well, the I, challenge of I, I building didn't. that case? Well, I do. I, I don't think I knew all of that when I went to law school. But yes, uh, the build the case and, and to express uh, your clients' objectives with the logic necessary and, and, and the need. And, and, I, and I think to express it, I don't do it much with anger and stuff. Uh, as I told my, I taught at UT Law School for 13 years as an adjunct professor. And I told my students then, being an ass is rarely persuasive. <laughs> and, and it truly is. Sometimes, sometimes some lawyers think that's a way to, to do it. Right. I think be perseverant. Mm -hmm. I think cross-examine well and thoroughly. And, and to do what you got to do to let the truth come out. Right. But to go beyond that is a, is a mistake. And I do like the challenge of it. Did you, did you like teaching law? Yes. Is that, why did you like teaching law? What, what, I don't know. I think it's genetics. I think back in Ireland, some of my family members were teachers. Mm. Uh, my sisters are teachers. Uh, and I, what did I like? The brightest young students about to graduate from law school, wanting to learn and a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> so it, you had to be on your toes. You learn the subject when you do that. Did you see some students that you just were wowed by, that you just were so impressed with? Oh, yes, yes. I, most of them, actually. <laughs> I said they're smarter than I am. Uh, but there were, uh, there, uh, yes, I, you see, those who need a little push, mm -hmm. mostly not because UT, uh, allows in a high quality level of students. So most, all of them were really clearly smart enough to do the work. Maybe some of them had, were more mature than others. You so you kind of help those through. And, mm -hmm. and, and the others, uh, boy, they're just self-starters. You just, they just don't know the subject matter. They don't know what to do because a lot of people in law school, that's fine, you go to law school, but you don't know a thing about doing an opening statement mm -hmm. or a cross-examination or a, uh, direct examination or a closing argument. Is it a profession you encourage people to go into? Absolutely. You get to help people. You work with people. You, you can affect change in what's happening in their lives. And you can also help them through a problem. Maybe the hardest thing to do, the thing I like least, I guess, other than losing a case, which I clearly don't do well, but, but Unfortunately, not too often. They uh, is telling someone who's been hurt by someone that I understand that, but you don't have a case. That's hard because they don't want to hear it, and I don't blame them. And they may have been wronged, 
But there may be a case where you've been harmed. But the cost of proceeding, and I don't mean the lawyer's cost, the cost of experts, the cost of all of this, today's litigation is different than when I started. It's a lot more expensive. Because you have to bring in so many elements. Well, like in a medical case. In, a, in a, say, a medical malpractice case, maybe somebody's been harmed. Maybe the most you would get out of the case would, and all you can do, you can't, we don't do for arm for an arm in this world these days, or at least in our part of the world. All you can do is do money. And what does that give the people? Mostly it's a sense of justice. Very few people are as, as much interested in the money as righting of wrong. But if I've got an expert that I've got to find and he's going to charge me $1,500 an hour, boy, that can add up. Yeah. Or ten to $15,000 to come to court to testify. So you have to tell sometimes that, look, that was wrong, I, I, I think. But the cost of that would be prohibitive. I don't like that these days. When I came out of law school, we didn't do all the depositions we do today, which can be make it excessively uh, uh, financially punishing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just, you got your facts, you got your witnesses, and you went to court. Right, right. I liked it, I liked it better. But, but I understand the difference. You know, you, we've got, this time is just running out, which is, uh, is unfortunate. I'm enjoying this a lot, and I know our viewers are. You're just a fascinating person. And Thank you. you've got a wonderful family. And I know that they're very important to you. Your son is practicing with you oh, now. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk just a few minutes about that. Well, tr Trevor was in Washington, D.C. as a legislative director with uh, Lincoln Davis, which was from your, yeah. near your area. And, uh, of course, elections do make a difference. Yes, yes. <laughs> At the same time, he and Meredith had a, uh, a, a baby mm -hmm. who's now two and a half, a little over two and a half years old. And Washington is not, they've not as nice a place to raise a child as in our area. And so ultimately they came, he had some opportunities there, but he decided to come back here and, and as he said, get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> and he's done very well here. That's wonderful. I know you're excited to have him here. And then there's my, my wife, Rhonda, who's, uh, we live on the mountain and up near here and uh, she, she grows all the herbs. I, I don't believe you could name an herb she isn't growing in like our yard cook, right? and we both like to cook and she's, I used to run marathons, I can't run anymore, but she is. Wow. And uh, tries to keep me staying healthy even though I can't run. That's great. And, and you travel, you like to travel. Yes, we do. And, and you lost a son. Your son? I did, Devin, uh, when he was 31, uh, had brain cancer. He had brain cancer when he was 25. He lived for seven years. Uh, you may not have time for me to talk about him because I, it goes, I'm, I, I guess what is the harm, particularly in this time after we've learned of the tragedy in Connecticut, yeah. is it brings a lot of things back. Anybody who's watching your program that has lost a child will know what I'm talking about. He helped me a lot because from the time he, he was the toughest young man I ever met. He learned to, he jumped out of an airplane when he was in college. He learned how to fly an airplane when he played football. Uh, you knew if you heard a loud noise, he had hit somebody. But never with, never with anger, just, that's just his, he played it a hundred percent. Afterwards, after the cancer, for seven years, he ran 25 or 30 marathons, 15 or so triathlons, Ironman, uh, he gave it all he had all the time. And, and was happy about it. Yeah. That's inspirational, and, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, in the minute we have left, what's next for you, Mike? Uh, I, I'm hoping to continue on, uh, continue practice of law. Uh, we have six lawyers here. We've got cases all over our area and eastern and middle Tennessee mm -hmm. and some other areas. 
and I uh, I like doing that. I, I, I don't know that I would know how your life becomes you, you become it. I don't know how I would do it not to come back down to this office and deal with people's lives, to deal with our practice, and also to paint and write. Well, this community is certainly, certainly privileged to have you, and, and uh, thank you so much for taking this time. It's been a real treat. Thank you very much for having me.